uh, but they will get the benefit of this. All right, we are now recording for our session tonight. And one thing I want to um, share with everybody, assuming that anybody who's not on the call is actually going to watch the video. Uh, I don't know whether that is the case or not. I haven't gone to look and see how many how many views there are on these things. But um, one thing that I really want to reinforce to you is that a, a big part of this class is the discussion board. Uh, that's where we share ideas. That's where we uh, grow in our thought processes. And it really has been pretty discouraging so far because we get to Wednesday and there's not a lot out there. And it's, uh, it's usually the case where there's a couple of people that will post on, on Tuesday and maybe uh, one or two more in the middle of the day Wednesday. But anybody who wants to post on Tuesday and get into a discussion finds that there's not much out there until Wednesday night or Thursday morning. And, and that's hard for you to, to have really good discussions that go. The whole point of that thing is to, to share ideas and to um, throw out your perspective on things and give people an opportunity to reinforce that or to say, well, have you thought about this or that? And so there's a couple of components that I, I really want to underscore in regards to the discussions. Number one, it's going to help everybody in the class if you get on that thing early. If you make that initial post Monday or Tuesday instead of waiting until Wednesday afternoon, which is which is the the bottom line expectation is that you've got it by Wednesday evening. Uh, but think in terms of your classmates and the purpose of this thing uh, and try to get that initial post out there early and get some discussion going on that. Um, another thing that I wanted to, to really reinforce is that. I have got the ability to look and see how many of the posts you have actually read. Uh, when you pull up one of the discussion threads and as you scroll down, when you, you'll notice initially that there's a little blue bar on the left side of the discussion. And as you scroll down through that thing, when you get to the bottom of it, it changes the blue bar to nothing. And if you don't spend enough time looking at that thing, those things never get rid of blue. And Georgia View tracks how many of those things you've actually read. Um, when you click the little triangle next to the topic heading, it gives you an option to mark as read. So even if you haven't scrolled to the bottom of it, you can, you can force the computer to think that you've read it. Uh, and again, I've got the ability to run a report that tells me how many of those things you've read and how many you haven't. And it's really low. Uh, so what it's, uh, unless it's malfunctioning somehow, what it's telling me is that unfortunately, not only are some of your classmates not posting much to the boards, they're not even reading what's out there. Uh, and I'm going to go on record at this point, now that we've gone through the first series of these things, it's, it's, it's important for you to be reading those things normally anyway. But it's, it's crucially important for you, if it's your week as the leader, to, have, to be reading through all those things. So I'm going to put a component into the grading for, for your week when you're leading. It doesn't apply to your weeks when you're not. So it'll only happen one more time. But I'm going to put into a, a component into the grading that factors in how many of those things it, show, it says that you've read. And if, you ha if you're the leader of the group and you haven't read many of what your classmates have posted, you haven't done your job as a leader. Um, I'm asking you to, to come up with the articles, to come up with the discussion question and the talking points, but it doesn't end there. You're supposed to interact with them on the discussion boards. Uh, and the, the basic grading expectations for the discussion board is that you do the same three that everybody else does. But I'd like to see you do more when you're the leader. I'd like to see you a little more active than you would normally be. Um, and as far as the discussion goes, it's 10 points if you do the three. But it'll factor into the next round of leader points, uh, how much you're interacting with the rest of the class. So we're going we're gonna to step up our game a little bit when we start round two. Everybody okay with that? Everybody understand that? Not okay in the sense that you approve, because that's not your place to approve, but understand. We're not going to vote on whether we do it or not. We're going to vote on whether we understand or not. Okay, very good. 
All right, well, let's transition into our topic for the, for the week, and that is body art. And uh, Ashley Hauser and Renee Thomas developed that. I think Ashley carried the bulk of the load trying to get it all set up. And we do have Ashley Hauser on the call with us. So we're going to let her unmute her mic. Uh, looks like, Ariel, you've still got your mic open. I'll get you to mute that. Ashley Hauser, unmute your mic and give us the overview for those who might not have read the talking points yet. Um, okay. Um, okay. Overview, Overview. Pretty much Pretty nice. to the point um, with how body art is going to develop in the next few years, um, and how what that means for a company because diversity is becoming um, more prevalent here in the United States, um, which that in turn kind of plays into Title VII with the religious discrimination. Um, some cultures and some religions do value body art. Um, so that's going to that's gonna be play into the whole religious discrimination of Title VII. Um, and then a lot of the sources also said 40% of millennials have at least one piece of body art. And I mean that could have that could be one tattoo that could be one um, piercing that's not in your earlobes, uh, and so as the millennials start going into supervisory roles, we're gonna I I think we're gonna see a shift. The one thing that did kind of astound me was that only 19 only 19 percent of companies, according to one study, has an actual policy in regards to body art. Um, and so that kind of got me thinking, you know, why don't more have this policy? So that's kind of where a lot of our discussion um, was born, is, is looking at that one, that one piece of information. Um, but I was really excited about this topic because I think it's going to, the interest and the focus is going to start increasing as your millennials are moving up into those managerial roles. All right, let me throw a question out there. You referenced that 19% of companies actually ha have a policy related to body art. Um, open discussion here, not necessarily just Ashley Hauser, but anybody who has a, a, an idea on the matter. What do you think the, be the bulk of those policies say? Do you think there's consistency among the policies that do exist? And if there is consistency, do they tend to have rules for it or is it typically blanket against it? My company actually does have one. They just implemented it about three months ago. Um, I actually have some, some body art other than the, the normal piercing for women. And that wasn't, we didn't have that policy in place when I was hired. Um, I've kind of had to change my wardrobe a little to make sure that my body art isn't showing because it, it's against it. it. It doesn't want it visible, it wants it concealed. Okay. So would it be fair to say that the policy at your place of, of employment is is kind of a tolerance policy that uh, if you have it, you have it, but just don't let us see it? Yes. I'm, I work in the banking industry, so they, they try to keep it as professional as they can be. I mean, you, you want to trust the people that are handling your money. So I think it, I think it's a as well as making sure that their their image is still where they want it. Okay, uh, we'll come back to that in just a second. Who else has some thoughts on what most of these policies probably look like? Does anybody else work at a place where there is a, an official policy that you know what it is? Yes, Kenneth. Um, so I'm at the FAA. We don't actually have a policy. Um, it just says that, you know, you'll show up to work, you know, presentable. But there isn't any specific uh, language in the union agreement that outlines specifically anything about tattoos and there isn't anything in 
FAA policy or regulation to date that outlines anything in regards to tattoos. Uh, on the Navy side of the house, they just revised the um, policy for basically everybody in the Navy where they relax the standards. Um, so now we can have sleeve tattoos, you can have a tattoo, I believe it's up to like the back of your neck where it's a, an inch in size. Um, so I know they just revised theirs, but because uh, I haven't come across a scenario for which I needed to read up on it, I honestly, I haven't even read it yet. I just know that there has been one update as of recent. Okay, good. I would imagine that especially in the Navy and the Marines, if you have a policy that says no tattoos, you basically don't have armed services anymore. Because I would imagine that more and more of them, I, my nephew uh, served a tour in the, the Marines and um, boy, when he came back after three years or four years or whatever it was, he did not look like the same person. He seemed like he got a tattoo everywhere he stopped. Kenneth. So uh, funny you say that. I had a Sergeant First Class, uh, basically a senior enlisted at Fort Jackson, and he has the tattoos where it covers his whole sleeve, and the Army changed its policy to where they dialed it back saying, hey, chill out with the tattoos. If you want to get one, you need to submit a request. And for him to stay in, he had to actually put in a request to have his, like they took pictures of the whole thing and he had to be approved to stay in with the tattoos he had and i thought that was kind of crazy wow Re retroactive approval uh and i and i guess the extreme of it is that uh you have to show us a picture of what you're going to get and see if we approve it bunny rabbits are okay flowers are okay um my nephew had his um, his unit number tattooed on his arm, and that disqualified him from any kind of special forces because they don't want you to, to have those kinds of things identified. Uh, but he also had uh, an Arabic thing uh, tattooed somewhere on him, the, the word infidel, so that if he ever got captured, they'd know right away that, that uh, he needed to be tortured. I don't know what the logic was behind that, but uh, he thought it was funny. Uh, Lauren. Um, I was just going to say for the military, I know my dad was telling me, of course, he retired from the Air Force back in 06, I believe. And when he retired, I know the policy um, was that tattoos couldn't be shown. Um, they couldn't be visible when they were in uniform. So I don't know. He wasn't sure if it's changed since then, but um, I'm going to do some research into that and see what it says. Okay, Kenneth, back to you. For the Navy and Marine Corps, it has changed since then. So, um, previously, yes, the the previous tattoo policy on both sides of the house was that if if you could see it when you're wearing a basically the uniform where it's kind of like you know the the t-shirt cut. And if you could see anything above the neckline, if you could see anything below the corner, I'm trying to get the, the angle right, the corner of the elbow, you know, all bets were off. But now since they changed it, um, like I said, you can have sleeves up to the ball of your wrist and that flies. Everything is cool. Or you couldn't even have anything on the neck. If you had anything on the neck, that was a showstopper. And now... You know, we have to break out a ruler and measure it and send a picture in to make sure it's good to go. So at least on the Department of the Navy side, things have gotten a whole lot more relaxed. And I mentioned that Army scenario because the, the Navy and Marine Corps got relaxed, but then the Army kind of ratcheted down a whole lot in comparison. Okay. Well, it seems like the, the trend generally is that um, because of, of image, because of professional image of the company, uh, we would prefer that you have no body art, that you have no piercings. Um, but if you do, because it's, it's your choice to do with your body as you will, 
make it to where you can't see them. Would you, would you think that that generally is the, the way that the policies have gone in the past? Okay. Um, when I worked at the hospital here locally years and years ago, uh, and Lauren is familiar with the hospital, um, I remember this is back in uh, 03, 05, 07 time frame when we would do orientation and we would talk about the this particular aspect of the policies, the HR director would come in and he would talk about how um, we, we don't, basically as, as we're saying here, we don't allow tattoos that you cannot cover up. Um, and that means either that you have to wear long sleeves if they're on your arms or you have to put some sort of a bandage or something on to hide them. And uh, bandages can be a little tricky because they can catch infection and things like that and spread. Um, but he would tell a story about somebody who came in for an interview, and I think he said that she had an eagle that went clear up her neck on this, under the side of the face. And it's like, you know, you can't hide that unless you, you know, unless you wear the, he, the, the hijab or whatever it is. Um, you're not going to hide that part of your body, so we're not even going to consider employing you. Um, what, what's the... The, um, the basic arguments that the company makes on why this is reasonable. Ashley Hauser. Um, I think in, in the reading, it mentioned the hospital, and I want to say I've read this in the past, that um, health care, they typically view it as a, a comforting thing. They don't want anything um, outlandish or anything that's going to potentially make the, the patient uncomfortable because they're already in a, uh, most of the time if you're in a hospital, you're already in a, uh, a pretty bad situation um, or at least you're sick. Uh, so they don't want to make the patient any more uncomfortable than they have to and, dis and distract them from what they're really there for. Okay, that make that makes some sense in terms of a hospital healthcare type of environment. But what about your banks? What about um, you know Coca Cola or Georgia Southwestern or something that, that doesn't have that same kind of rationale behind it? Why would they have a policy? I think that goes back to the stigma and the stereotypes that accompany tattoos and body art. Okay, Ashley Bundrick. I think it's just about image and wanting to come off as professional and, you know, there to help the customer. And I think with body art, you might be presenting things that are really individual to you and not really representative of the image or the um, perspectives of the company. Okay. Um, now, who who's in the, the proper place to determine what's professional? Uh, does the, does does my perspective that your tattoo uh, doesn't look pro professional carry any more weight than, than your perspective that it doesn't not look professional? Kenneth. Well, if if I'm the customer and I'm coming to your place of business and let's say hypothetically somebody had something that I personally find offensive, um, I may not be willing to come back there for fear, not necessarily fear, but it's just like they're endorsing this person to be here. I don't want to be around that. I might have my kids with me that day. I might, you know, I let's say I find offense with it, I may take my business elsewhere. I may go out of my way to go somewhere else. Okay. Ashley B. Um, I was just going to say, as far as like overall blanket policies, I think it can be really difficult, especially legally, to say, okay, we're going to set these standards and this is what we think is appropriate and this is what isn't. But I think when you're talking about individual businesses, I mean, it's up to the owner and it's up to what they decide their image should be in their mission is as a business and you know some body art might fit well into that and some body art might not so i guess it's up to the owner okay what are the what are the potential problems with having a policy 
let's think about this from from HR. Uh, corp the uh, administrative team comes to comes to you as HR and says, "What do we need to do about body art? Should we have a policy? What should that policy say? You do your pros and cons. Uh, what are those con cons, Ashley Hauser?" Um, I, I think one of the biggest issues with not having a policy is, is that it's potentially unfair um, because you may have someone who's got an offensive tattoo like Kenneth said, but then you may have some other person that has a little tattoo of a smiley face or a heart or something that's not offensive at all. And without a policy or I don't know if it should be blanket, I, I'm kind of on the fence about that. But without like actual documentation, how do you determine, I mean, do you just tell the one who's got the offensive tattoo to cover up? Or are you going to make it your job to tell everyone that's got a tattoo if you don't have the policy? What, you know, it's, it's what are people going to do? What are those managers going to do? Are they going to use their own bias and their judgment to make these decisions if they don't have a policy? And I think that's getting to the heart of why we have a policy that says no tattoos, because the, we can't possibly have a policy that says no skulls, no crosses, uh, no weapons of mass destruction, no curse word. I mean, how long would the list have to be? And sure enough, if I'm determined to get a, if I'm determined to display my rebel spirit and get a tattoo, I'm going to study this list and I'm going to go, you know what? You don't have this on the list. So Bazinga, you know, there it is. That's my tattoo, and it takes up my entire arm, and it's not on the list. Ha ha in your face, right? We can't make a list of everything. Uh, and you can't very well say tattoos that are in good taste because you don't think this is not in good taste. And I think that's why we have kind of gone with uh, no tattoos. Just let's just eliminate all of them because we can't pick and choose. Uh, Morgan Bell. I actually work in the um, public school system, and I was just looking through my employee handbook, and then we don't have anything about body art. And I've actually worked, a co-worker of mine had tattoos all the way up his forearms, and we actually have a teacher that has the um, the stretched earlobes. And okay, and we haven't talked about that yet, but, um, you know, that's probably part of the overall discussion, too. Uh, and I assume what you're talking about is is that they, they stretch the lobes by putting the the for circles or the pegs or whatever it is in there. Um, does that potentially turn off some people? Yeah, I'm sure it does. But um, I would just think, like working in a school system, that there would be a policy about that, but there's actually not. Yeah. Ashley H, unmute. Ashley Hauser, did you start to say something a second ago? Looked like oh. you were mouthing something, but your yeah, mic was. I was just that. That kind of goes back to the whole. I was shocked by that too. Um, when I was reading that study about there only being nineteen percent of companies having policies, and you would think something like a school system, you know, would have that, but then they don't. Okay, Ashley Bundra. Um, I'm pretty sure my school system actually did because. My Spanish teacher had a teeny tiny little tattoo on her leg and she liked to wear capris all the time and they made her cover it up. And I remember being in class one day and somebody actually said something to her about it. And I mean, this thing is like the size of a quarter and it's on her leg and they made her cover it all the time. So. Uh, and, and that's, that's where we start to get a little bit dicey because um I think especially with ladies right around the ankle is, is something small is becoming very trendy. Right. And that's hard to cover up. You know, if you're a guy, you just wear tube socks or something, but, but ladies don't do that. So it becomes really tough uh, to, to cover something like that up. Do we have potential problems legally if we tell you that you can't have tattoos? Ashley H is saying yes. Ashley B is saying yes. One of y'all, jump in what's the legal problem well some people for their religion especially i think like eastern religions they have tattoos um 
I don't know a ton about it. I just know that they do. Um, also, I think you could get an illegal issue if you say don't have a policy, like we were saying most businesses don't, and then you don't you don't um, enforce your unofficial policy consistently. So maybe you're you're picking on certain people and not others, and that can turn into a situation. Um, okay. Yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> All right, Ashley H. started to say something. Is there other legal problems? It, it was mainly the same thing about the religious discrimination. Okay. If you don't uh, give some sort of accommodate, try to accommodate, there can be legal issues. Okay. Uh, you could potentially have a problem with religion if that is a fundamental part of your religion. Um, and, and you, you might have to make the case as the employee that your religion dictates that you have to. And I don't know that there's a lot of religions that dictate that you have to. Some religions, um, it's, it's looked upon favorably. Um, but I would think that if you can't say, I had no choice because my religion requires that I do this, there, then you certainly would have a problem saying, well, you know, you're just picking on me because I'm this, this particular religion. Um, who, who would most likely in our workplace today have tattoos? What are the common characteristics of people that have tattoos? Gender, age, nationality, any of those kinds of things. Ashley H. Uh, your millennials definitely have make up the majority of that. Um, and then I was kind of surprised at this, but um, women are actually more likely to have a tattoo, and that, that's increasing. Okay. Uh, millennials, and we will start to see which is the Y, and um, we'll start to see more and more of the Z are going to have tattoos, which means that, by and large, who doesn't? If Y and Z do, who doesn't? Lauren? Like the older generation, like the, I would say like the baby boomers. Or, okay. Uh, People like me, yeah, the older generation, baby boomers typically don't. Uh, and, and this is, this is general blanket statements. Of course, there are a lot of baby boomers who do, but um, generally speaking, baby boomers don't. And uh, Gen X, uh, especially the older of the Gen X, don't. So if it's typically the younger people that do, where's the legal problem with that? We don't discriminate against you because you're young. We can't discriminate against you because you're young. We can only discriminate against you if you're over 40. So if it were the reverse, where you were more likely to have a tattoo if you were over 40, then that could become a discrimination issue with age discrimination. What about gender? Because there's more females than males that are getting uh, tattoos, now you're singling them out. Okay. Uh, especially if your policy says that you have to hide it, and it's harder for the females to hide the tattoos because they're on the ankles and whatnot. Um, now, in your research, have you found, a couple of you made this comment, and I just want to kind of explore and clarify a little bit. Are you finding that women are getting more tattoos than men are? Because what, what I tend to see is, as Kenneth was saying, the sleeves. The guys, if they tattoo, it's, it's, a, it's a big job. So they may have one massive tattoo where ladies might have a whole bunch of smaller tattoos. Ashley B. Yeah, I think that the statistic might be a little bit skewed because I think that maybe women are getting them um, in places like their backs where you don't see it as much. So like maybe women do have more tattoos, but like you're saying, they're smaller. Maybe they're not on the arm. You know, I don't see a lot of women going around with like sleeve tattoos and things. Most people I know have it on their back or their shoulder or something easy to cover in my opinion. Yeah, my, my hunch would be that the, as you say, the ladies are having the smaller tattoos that are generally speaking easier to hide. And, and granted, my, my framework on this is watching baseball games and football games where the, where the guys have tattoos all over their arms. It's like there's not a, a millimeter, square millimeter of skin that doesn't have ink on it somewhere. And that is a little bit more of an extreme. Um, if, if males and females are equally likely to have tattoos, there's no gender discrimination with a policy like that. Uh, you, you can't hit age discrimination until you get older. 
Uh, it seems to be kind of across the board in terms of the ethnic mix of people who have tattoos. So you don't really have uh, race discrimination. Morgan Bell. Would you make an exception if it was religious? Like if the tattoos were for religious reasons in your policy or, or would that you, be kind of just... I think you got to be careful in putting that in writing that we will make an exception. If, if the policy generally is no tattoos, if you make a statement on there that says we will make an exception for religious accommodation, uh, now I've opened the door that all you got to do is claim that it's religious and I kind of have to let you go with it. Um, and I don't know how, how you really enforce that. So what it, I think it really gets down to from the, from the organizational standpoint is that image thing. Um, and what is, what is traditionally the image that we're trying to maintain? Kenneth. Clean cut, wholesome, professional. Clean cut, wholesome, professional, all American. Yeah, exactly. And and who who created that definition? Let me answer the question for you. It was baby boomers. It was coming out of the war. It was the baby boomers. It was my generation that defined what all American is. It was the, the, the farm boy, you know, the blonde haired farm boy who was big and strapping and clean cut, clean shaven, wore nice clothes. Um, the guy next door kind of thing. And that's really not who we are anymore, is it? So why do we need to have a body art policy? Does the fact that you have visible body art make you unable to do your job? Does it potentially create any hardship for the company? Somebody made the comment earlier that potentially you walk into a store, you see somebody with body art and you say, you know what, I'm not going to shop here anymore. Do you, do you think that's likely to happen? Uh, do most customers say, you know, that's strange, but, you know, I'm going to shop where I'm going to shop, and that employee's not going to change my mind. Ashley Bunder. Uh, you basically said what I was just going to say. That one argument is that you might turn off customers, but if I need to shop somewhere and, you know, somebody's got body art, as long as it's not grotesque, it's not going to scare me away. You know, if I need to shop there, I'm going to shop there and they can do what they want. It's their body. It doesn't really affect me. But yeah, I mean, that is one argument. And I think it's kind of a weak one because I think in most, only in extreme cases, is it really going to make people avoid your business? Okay. Kenneth. So in my discussion post, um, I tried, what I tried to do is I tried to find the most, basically the extreme. I believe that I found that person. So if I walked into a place of business and the, the young lady that I posted, she has the implants where it's knotted out of her head. She's got the, the things coming down her nose. She's got it in her eyebrows and her earrings. And she's got the, the I can put my fist through her earlobe thing. If I go into Kroger and she's working there and I've got my kids with me and I've got to explain that later, Nah, we're we're probably gonna shop somewhere else. If it if I weren't a parent, yeah, I would. You know, I, I'm like, hey, to each his own. But I have to be a little more careful about what I expose my kids to, and that is not something that I want to explain to a four and a six year old. Okay, so maybe we've crossed into a, a little bit of a different discussion here in terms of the extremes. Uh, that if we are if we are enjoying the the body art and, and all that stuff in some degree of moderation, sensible, reasonable moderation, we're we're good. But when you start going crazy, oh, well, now we start got now we got to figure out what crazy sounds like. You know, we got to be able to put that into words. 
and um, in such a way that we don't make you feel like we're picking on you. Uh, Kenneth. Well, I mean, I'll be honest, when I, the, the first thing that came to mind when the, the topic came up, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the, the, the small tattoo on the ankle. It wasn't the, the tattoo on the, the upper shoulder. It wasn't the tramp stamp on your lower back. Ooh, it was the, the, the image that came to mind was the far extreme where it's just like, okay, I can't have you, I literally can't have you in front of people. That, like, it, like I said, if, if it's something basic, if it's something, you know, that, you know, a, if I go to the beach, if you're generally going to see it from 50, 100 people, the, the, the same stuff, it's like, okay, I'm not going to necessarily have a problem with that. It's, I believe that policies are written not necessarily for the the general populace. It's to avoid those extremes and to give you some sort of a leeway to handling those that are at the outliers of the group, so to speak. Okay. Uh, it might be an interesting project for the end of the semester to think through what a body art policy would look like uh, and how it would be phrased so that it doesn't discriminate and it is defensible and you know it's something that could could be sold to management that might be an interesting thing to be thinking about um wh what are the what are the drawbacks of having a a, a no body art policy Lauren. Well, I was just kind of thinking of what Ashley said earlier, kind of when if you put a policy in place and there's people already there that have tattoos, you kind of have to, or body art in general, you have to kind of go back and reevaluate that. So that could be a issue. And then, um, I don't know, that's a drawback for me, I would think. Okay. If you introduce a policy tomorrow, you got to figure out what do you do with the people who, who already had them. You, you could very clearly say from this point forward, no new ones. What about the people who already have them? You either have to let them go. You can't very well remove the thing. You may have to grandfather them in and say they're okay because they already worked for us. That can have some problems. Morgan Bell. I think like Kenneth was saying, like the extreme, like if you don't have a policy and somebody comes to interview and they, <clears throat> their body art is at the extreme, you can't say I'm not going to hire you because of your body art. Well, I guess so it depends, a, depends on if it's right to work because you could theoretically turn anybody down for any reason whatsoever. Now, you may have to go to court and defend it. Now, okay, what, what did we say was more common about people who have body art as opposed to people who don't? They're younger. Okay. If, it's, if you've got to put people in two categories, all of you who have body art come over here, all of you who don't have body art go over there, you would expect to see some degree of age separating, wouldn't you? I mean, there'd be some younger folks who don't, and there'd be some older folks who did. But by and large, the one group is mostly older people, and the other group is mostly younger people. Is that reasonably fair? Right? The, the, the group with the body art would, would have more younger people than it would have older people. All right, so if we have a policy that outlaws body art, who are we excluding from our company? Kenneth. The workers. Okay. All of the, the, the younger people that are, have the potential to take over your company one day. Oh boy, yeah. We potentially exclude younger people. That's not in and of itself something that gets us into trouble because they're not protected. 
but we may be shooting our foot because the people that we have are the older people who won't be here a whole lot longer anyway. Who's going to replace them? Who's going to replace the older people who don't have body art? Gonna be, it's going to have to be the younger people who do have body art. If we've got a 50-year-old who's the CEO, when she retires, who takes her place? Somebody who's younger. And that younger person may be more likely to have body art. But we just said, sorry, we don't want you because you don't fit with our culture. And we don't have them to step up into the ranks anymore. So if it is, generally speaking, the older people who are making the policy and they're creating a policy that is comfortable for them based upon what their view of America ought to be, what their view of professional ought to be, as they transition out of the workforce, who's coming along behind them to rewrite policies? For the sake of time, I'll answer my own question. It's younger people who don't have a problem with body art, isn't it? Yeah, and what kind of policies are they going to write? More lenient policies. They're going to write policies that are more lenient, that are more accepting, that are more general in nature. Now, might those policies have some degree of subjectivity built into them uh, along the lines of don't be extreme? Yeah, they might. Um, I, there are some percentage of the younger population that likes the idea of extreme, and uh, they're kind of kind of radical and and all. But um, by and large, I think still most of the population is is still reasonably conservative in its viewpoints. Those who have tattoos don't typically go crazy with it. So where we may where we may be going right now is, you know, how do we eliminate the body art? You know, we may not think that that is appropriate in the work environment, but how do you re realistically eliminate that? How do you get around that? You may not be able to. We may be trying to create policies that say don't. But the reality is that it, within the next 10 years, we're going to have to have policies that say, you know, that's OK if, you, if you're smart about it. But back to an earlier comment, it's a whole lot easier to say no than it is to say maybe. You can get in a whole lot more trouble with maybe than you can with no. So I have the, 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 the comfort of knowing that you're the one who has to deal with it, not me. I'm going to be retired. And you're going to be making the decisions and writing the policies. And you've got to figure out how to do it. Uh, but you're going you're gonna to step into the process of figuring out how to do it with the perspective that it's your generation and you understand your generation. And uh, those of you who have the body art are going to have a completely different perspective than I do with no piercings and no tattoos and no, none of that kind of stuff. I, I, I can't even begin to understand why you would want somebody to burn your skin. I don't know. That just doesn't make sense to me. And that may not even be an accurate depiction of what happens, but uh, it's going to be an interesting topic, isn't it? All right, we will wrap up this call tonight. I appreciate uh, Ashley H. for your uh, legwork in getting this all set up. I'm going to encourage you all to get active on those discussion boards and uh, to try to kind of open up these kinds of questions. And um, you can kind of remember who's been on the call, who's been uh, popping in with, with comments and things. Think about who hasn't been on the, the, on the call. And uh, as they are bringing up comments, Get them to think about some of the things that we've talked about here, the discrimination and um, who does it impact and um, what kind of a, of a difference does it really make in terms of public image and public perception? Does, that, does, does having a couple of cashiers with some tattoos on their arms really hurt our credibility in the community as much as we want to pretend like it does? You know, where do we... If we, if we start to generate policies that have some degree of tolerance and allowance, where do we stop? Get people to think about that. Um, I don't remember what the topic was, but just within the last week or two, we had a really interesting discussion on our phone call 
and um, it was kind of interesting to watch the rest of the discussion board because the people who weren't on the dis on the call went a completely different direction with the with the discussion and offered up some arguments that we talked about on the call that really don't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, and, and they had absolutely no idea that there was a different way of looking at it because they missed a phone call. Ashley B. Um, this was something I thought about saying earlier, but I don't know how everybody else feels, but one of the reasons that I usually wait until Wednesday to post is because these calls really help me to focus my thoughts and help me see different perspectives. And so by the time I go and make the post, I'm really clear on what my position is. Now, I don't want to discourage you from taking a position early on. Uh, and I think it was, um, what was the discussion just in the last week or two? It may have, may have, uh, have we done ban the box yet? I can't remember which, which class I have that's doing different things. There was, there was some changing of the focus with that one, I think. And it just, it seems like it was, it might've even been last week that some folks, um, pay for potential was one of them. Yeah, there was, there was a pretty, pretty radical shifting of the thought after the phone call. Um, and, I, and I don't want to discourage you from posting before the phone call, even if it turns out that you completely change your mind. That's okay. That's what that's that's one of the purposes of this class is to give you a chance to develop some initial thoughts and then maybe kind of shift them a little bit as you hear what other people say. And we somebody's got to start the conversation. Kenneth. So it was pay for potential last week. I think uh, the early posters. We, we, and I was one of them, we kind of went in one direction and that phone call kind of gave us a different perspective to, to, to think about. And it was just like, oh, I didn't even think about that. But it also feeds into why I try and post on Monday and Tuesday because, you know, my perception or my interpretation of the question or the topic at hand may not necessarily be right and i don't want to personally i don't i don't want to seem like one of those people where it's just like well i'm not gonna say anything i'd rather just go ahead and say something maybe somebody else comments on it and says something before the call um and then that kind of gets me to, to to thinking in a different perspective because ultimately i'm going to sit in on the call to see what's going on and that will drive uh, my thought process for the remainder of the week. Okay, very good. Um, so let me encourage you, go ahead and put some thoughts out there, even if, you're, even if you change your mind after the Tuesday night call, because, because what we say on this call isn't necessarily right. It's, it, it's a couple of thoughts, uh, and they may be different from what you initially put out there on Monday or Tuesday, but it doesn't mean that it's wrong. But let me encourage you also to access those articles that they've put out there for you to read. Uh, and I got the impression with the, the pay for potential that there was even a lot of people posting on Thursday and Friday that had not read those articles. They didn't have any framework whatsoever as to what the literature was saying and what the practitioners were saying. They were just kind of uh, throwing their ideas out there. And it's okay that you have your ideas, but the, the point of all this is to see what's going on in the real world and to see um, on particular issues that are emerging where the trends seem to be going so that when you're in the position to make these decisions that you kind of know what's going on out there. So be reading those articles, looking for the highlights of those things, finding your own articles and your own research. Uh, and I really like the idea that y'all are jumping into these phone calls and sharing your, your thoughts here. The, the ones who aren't making the phone calls are missing an awful lot of great conversation that could have a big impact on those discussion boards. All right, any last thoughts about body art? Tattoos, piercings. We didn't really get much into the, the, the piercings. Uh, it is becoming a whole lot more common for guys to have ear piercings and for girls to have multiple ear piercings. It's becoming more and more common for, um, at least for, from, from what I'm seeing, girls to have the, the piercings on the nose. Uh, piercings on the, the lips, perhaps. We didn't really talk about that a whole lot. Um, I never could really understand why people would, would do that kind of thing, especially if they were around smaller kids, because kids like to grab and pull, and that could be very painful. But anyway, that's uh, that's that's beyond the topic for tonight, because it's about time to wrap this thing up. All right. Well, once again, I'll thank you for your time tonight.
and I'm going to start setting my sights on next week. We've had a couple of weeks in a row now where we didn't have anybody from the outside joining us just because it was hard to line up some schedules. But we do tentatively have somebody that's going to be joining us next week to talk about our discussion on gender identity, which will be kind of an interesting topic. So y'all be thinking ahead, and um, we will see you then. Um, give me good reasons to say nice things about you on your midterm grades. They'll be out there sometime Monday. Maybe that'll be a part of our call next week. Y'all have a good night, and uh, online students don't really get to, to enjoy the benefits of the fall break, which is Thursday and Friday. Uh, Y'all don't have much of an opportunity. Unless you start posting now, you can, be all, you can be done with all your posts before fall break begins on Thursday and not have to worry about it. As always, I will uh, let you guys log out first. Good night.